It's good to see you all here tonight. You're looking healthy, so you already, most of you anyway, have something to be thankful for. So I'm excited to talk to you tonight because I think tonight's topic is uh, really, really important. I want to talk to you about the wilderness experience that Israel went through. Uh, so you can turn in your Bibles to Numbers chapter 1, but as, as we come to the end, we're not coming to the end of the Old Testament, we're coming to the end of this, this um, picture we're painting with the divine agenda, and this is what I want you to see. In the book of Genesis, we were tracking how humanity was created with purpose. They were walking with God, they were in relationship with God, and the original mandate was that they were going to take God's goodness and they were going to be fruitful and multiply and cover the face of the earth. And by doing so, they would be God's image bearers, God's representatives, and they would cover the earth with His glory. That was the original plan. But then we know humanity rebelled. They fought against Him. They sinned against Him. So we, we have the fall in the Garden of Eden. Uh, we, we see uh, the fall expressing itself with Cain and Abel. Uh, we saw the, uh, the, the evil that people went to when God brought the flood, and it was though they were doing evil continually, the Lord said. Then we got to Babel, and we see yet another form of rebellion. And what we see over and over is rather than God's people carrying out God's uh, commands, God's ways, we have people that begin to carry out their own agendas in their own way. And it makes a real mess of things. And the Bible really is uh, a book about God's redemption story calling people back to himself, trying to get it back to the picture, his original design, where people are in perfect harmony with him, uh, evil is overcome and abolished, and there is stability, harmony, and the design as God originally planned. So we are given this promise in Genesis chapter 3 that a deliverer would come. So we can see our, our own part in that story. We can see where in our own lives we have rebelled. We have uh, pushed against God. And we have gotten ourselves into a place where we are not in right relationship with Him. Then we go to Exodus. Because humanity did their own thing their own way, they, they ended up in, in a miserable place. I mean, the, the world was corrupt. Uh, there, there was pain, there was suffering, evil and chaos uh, were rampant, and even God's own people were enslaved by this system, and they needed to be freed from that. So the book of Exodus is, is about God bringing His people out of slavery. And again, we can see our story in that. We can remember how in our rebellion against God, God still came to us and delivered us from the situation that we were in and brought us into a right relationship with Him. So, you know, Egypt, I'm sorry, uh, Exodus is about bringing those people out of Egypt and their slavery and, and then learning how to be in a relationship with God after that deliverance. We had the Ten Commandments. Uh, we have the tabernacle, and we talked through all of that. Then we have the book of Leviticus, which we didn't spend a lot of time in, but we, we did note that this was this book teaching how Israel now in a relationship with God, in the presence of God, they had to learn how to conduct themselves in God's special family and in the presence of a holy God. So he was teaching them how to do sacrifices, how to give offerings, how to worship, how to do all these different things. So it's really important that you see that in the, the very first verse in Leviticus, God is speaking to Moses from the tabernacle, but Moses can't come into his presence yet because they have to be sanctified. They have to be set apart. So again, in our own story, once God saves us and we come into a right relationship with him through Jesus Christ, now we have to learn how to be sanctified. How does this work? How do we walk with a holy God? How do we be a people filled with the Spirit, obedient to the will of God? So once he takes them through Leviticus, we find ourselves in the book of Numbers, and we know that Leviticus worked because it says in Numbers 1.1, 1, 1, 
A year after Israel's departure from Egypt, the Lord spoke to Moses in the tabernacle. He's no longer talking to Moses from the tabernacle with Moses on the outside. So Leviticus worked. Now they can approach God and they can be in right relationship with him. But numbers, I want to I want to focus not so much on that phrase in the tabernacle, but the phrase after it, in the wilderness. God spoke to Moses in the wilderness. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. Because just like we can see our story play out in the rebellion in Genesis, just as we can see our story play out uh, in our relationship with Christ being delivered from our sins in the book of Exodus. Now we're going to see how we fit in with Israel's period of wandering, which is a frustrating part of the story. In fact, if I could summarize the book of Numbers in just one sentence, it would be Israel wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. That's, that's basically what the book is about. And it's frustrating to watch, it's frustrating to read, and when we're there ourselves, it's a frustrating place to be. Nobody loves to be in the wilderness. So I, I want you to see how the wilderness is going to be a part of your spiritual journey. This, these are things that are embedded in the Christian experience. No one is exempt from any parts of this journey, and the wilderness will also be part of your journey. In the wilderness is a place of teaching. Uh, it is a place of testing. It's a place of tempting. Uh, the wilderness is where we find out what is our faith made of. And it's, it can be brutal, but it really is God's classroom. And I, I want you to think of it that way, okay? Uh, the wilderness is God's classroom. And it is key to understand, as we begin to talk about the wilderness and the role it's going to play in our spiritual formation, that God is always at work in the wilderness. And that's important to understand because oftentimes when we're wandering in a wilderness, it feels like God is a million miles away. And if we don't understand what's actually taking place in God's classroom, we can become frustrated and we can lose our footing, we can lose our faith. We have to know and understand the wilderness's place in our journey, just like these other aspects that we have studied through. And that's what tonight is about. The wilderness is not a place where God abandons us. The wilderness is a place where God makes our purpose very clear. It's very necessary and it's very painful there are those lessons in our lives that we, we cannot learn apart from pain and some of the things that God wants to teach us, the painful things, are going to be learned in the wilderness. And God does not protect us from pain in the wilderness. It's part of the growing up experience. It's part of our maturity in Christ. And, and a good father will do that. If, if my number one objective as a father were to keep my children from pain, they would have pretty miserable childhoods. I'd restrict them from all kinds of things, trying to just keep them from pain. But what they're going to learn is through the pain they experience as a child and growing up, some of the best life lessons are going to come from that. So the wilderness is going to be one of those places that we're going to experience pain. Here's another part of the wilderness we don't like. The wilderness is not typically experienced in a day or a week. We're usually talking months or years, and it is, it is a very dry place. It can be a very lonely place. It can be a very depressing place, and we don't want it to last. We want it to end. And, and when we're in the midst of this wilderness, often there's not a clear plan on this is the way out, this is where we're going. It's going to take us this long. I think one of the hallmarks of being in the wilderness is you're living one day at a time, and you're like, I, I don't have a plan. I don't know how to get past this. I don't know what's next. It's not a fun place. However, it is a place where our faith can be refined, and we can have such strength coming out of it, but we have to be 
on the same page as the teacher in this classroom or we can end up spending a lot longer time than we need to in this place. So, uh, you know, I'm thinking of uh, other people in the Bible that have gone through these experiences. You think of Job, he's a classic example. He went through a time, uh, a wilderness wandering, a testing where he had all kinds of questions, lots of pain, lots of suffering. I think of the Apostle Paul. He went to Arabia for three years and, and was, was spoken to by the Lord, but it was a time of isolation for him. I think of uh, Jesus himself in Luke chapter 4. The Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tested. And it's going to be a part of our experience as well. So I just wonder how many of you are resonating with some of this, that you're thinking, yes, I've been there, I've done that, I've experienced that, I know what you're talking about. Or maybe even some of you here tonight are, I'm in it right now. And if that's where you're at, I'm hoping that tonight the Lord is going to have such good news for you, some direction, because when we're in the wilderness, we're desperate for direction. And if you're not in it tonight, understand this. You are going to be doing ministry with other Christians who are going to be in it. And you need to know how to minister to them. You need to know how to help them through the journey in the wilderness. And you'll be there again. This is a common thread that runs through the Christian life. So the good news is, in Numbers 1.1, it says that the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness. In the wilderness is often when we hear very meaningful things. From the Lord. So before we dive into this any further, let me pray. Father, tonight I want to pray for those who, as I'm speaking right now, their hearts are saying, God, this is exactly where I'm at. I'm tired of it. I'm sick of it. I don't know that I can go on another day like this, but I just keep having to. I don't see the purpose in this. I don't know the direction I'm supposed to be going. I, I feel so spiritually dry, and I need direction from you tonight. And Father, I pray that you would give it to them. That tonight they would drink from a deep well. That they would be encouraged. And that they would understand the place that the wilderness plays in the journey of every Christian and the good that comes from it. So Father, lift us from despair, depression, dryness, and loneliness tonight and speak to us. We are listening. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Numbers 1.1. 1, 1. The Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness. That's all I need from Numbers 1.1. 1, 1. We're going to cover a lot of numbers tonight, so I can't spend too much time in chapter 1 because I want to get to chapter 2. And chapter 2 of the book of Numbers is an interesting one. It talks about the layout of the camp of Israel as they're now encamped around the Lord who is residing in the tabernacle. And I'm not going to read chapter 2, but the whole chapter of Israel is talking about the three tribes to the, to the north, the three tribes to the south, the three tribes to the east, the three tribes to the west, and then also the Levites in the center of the camp. This is what I want you to understand. Every single tribe is placed with purpose. The last verse in Numbers chapter 2 is the Lord saying, set them up exactly as the Lord has instructed. So there's, there's great purpose in all of this. Every single tribe is camped around the tabernacle with the Lord centered right in the middle. So understand this. After the deliverance, after they've been pulled from Egypt... Now, they're going to be in a place where they have to learn to put God in the center and follow His direction. Now, we can see why God is doing this because if we skipped over to Numbers chapter 9, we would see where He now begins to lead the, the camp with a pillar of smoke uh, by day and a pillar of fire by night. And, and everything Israel is doing, it's revolving around God's presence and God's direction. We have to get that right before we go through the wilderness. God is setting this up before He takes them through the wilderness. 
So understand this, it's going to be common in the Christian experience that we find deliverance in Christ, and the very first thing that God is going to begin to teach us is how to make Him the center of our life, because we're going to need that going forward as God teaches us some things in some dry and difficult and lonely places. We're going to have to learn how to follow God's direction. So you have these sheets at your table, see if you can find them, and if you're in the, if you're in the seated section here, um, let's see, I didn't plan this very well. If you have some extras at your table, let's share with these poor good folks up here in the front in the seated section. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, Ashley. Thanks, Nina. Look at that. They got your back. This is such a great church family. Does everybody have any? I think we're good. Everybody, if anybody needs one, put your hand up. We even have extras. Good, because I spilt coffee all over mine, Pete, so <laughs> I'll take a new one. Now, this, I'm kind of showing off my tech prowess with this chart. This represents the camps of Israel. You'll see there's 12 little lines around there, three on the top, three on the bottom, three on the left, three on the right, and then the tabernacle in the middle. And it was interesting because Barb is sharing some of her uh, studies. She had a study on this, and I was looking for something like this. Uh, and who was it? Um, Lauren Chandler. Yeah, yeah, she had something similar like this, so I kind of used her little model that she had here. And, and just like we can find an experience, uh, th this story is there to help us on the other side of the cross and understand our journey. So just like Israel was encamped, all around the throne of God, our lives now and all the compartments of our lives are to be centered around God. So if you're a good Christian and you've been in class long enough, you know that you're supposed to put God in the middle and you put all the aspects of your life, your marriage, uh, your kids, your job, your finances, all these types of things uh, in around the sides, and they're all facing the Lord. But let's, just, let's not just jump to what you're supposed to put on the piece of paper. Let's be like gut-level honest instead. And as you're looking at this, and you don't have to fill it out right now if, if being too close to your neighbor would make you feel bad about this, uh, but I want you to ask your question, this question, what really is in the center of your life? What's driving all the different compartments of your life? As you think of areas, and you might tuck this in your Bible and spend some time on this a little bit later, but as you start to think, you know, you could put some of those things on the lines, all these different things that take up time and energy and focus in your life, and what really is in the center? Because there's a lot of things that can end up in the center. And if you don't allow a real deep, honest conversation to take place with the Holy Spirit, you're going to fail this lesson in the wilderness. Because what we need to do is be able to identify when there is something that is getting re-centered in the middle of our lives that's not God. And if we can't identify that and fix that problem, guess what? When we get out into the wilderness, we're going to have a blind guide. Because if we've centered our our, our life around money, money is not going to lead you out of the wilderness. It'll keep you right there. Or maybe you center your life around a spouse or a significant person in your life. Well, if that gets in the center and it's driving everything that you're doing, you're going to get lost in the wilderness because that thing, that person, they're not equipped to bring you out of the wilderness. Maybe it's an idea or a dream. One day I just want to have a, a wife or a, a husband and something like a, a dream can get in there. But we've got to be careful if we're, if we're pushing everything in our life toward something that is not being directed by God, we can find ourselves wandering for a long time. Listen, Israel didn't get this right. They were supposed to wander just for a little while through the wilderness, like maybe a little more than a year, one to two years. And we know the story, they ended up wandering 40 years because they really messed this up. 
So we don't want extended seasons in the wilderness. Nobody wants to be in the wilderness longer than we have to be because it's a painful place to be. So take note, Numbers chapter 2, every part of Israel is designed to be facing God. Their lives revolved around God. That is a picture and a reflection of how our lives need to be. When we receive Christ as Lord, God begins to work on this immediately. It's of first importance. It is a primary focus. He is going to teach us how to reorient our lives around our agendas to His, around ourself to Him. You cannot make it through the wilderness if this is not in the right order. Now, it's interesting because Exodus, I mentioned earlier, was about God taking His people out of Egypt. Numbers, this wilderness, this place of wandering, it's going to be about God getting the rest of Egypt out of His people. Because now that they've been delivered from that awful environment where they were hated slaves and worked to the bone. Life was awful. They're going to start to look back longingly and say, oh, remember the things we had in Egypt? And God has to strip that from them. God's got to get all of that out of them. He's got some work to do. So in the wilderness, understand that God is going to confront any part of the former life that he delivered you from that you're still hanging on to. That's part of what the wilderness is about. And that's not fun because these are things that we are holding on to because we see value in them. Even though we might recognize, oh, God probably doesn't like that, but I'm going to keep that tucked in my back pocket. I'm going to hold that close. I'm, I'm going to bring that with me on the journey. Part of the wilderness is God saying, no, that's, that's got to go. And he will fix this in the wilderness as long as it takes. So as as you work on this, and, and I hope that you'll take the time to do this because it's a great tool between you and the Lord. You need to ask him the question without any defenses going up. God, is there anything that I am holding on to? that you have already delivered me from? Is there anything in my former life before I bowed before Christ as my king, when he set me free from all those things that enslaved me and forgave me for all my sin, is there anything that I have reached back and I am now trying to bring with me like the Israelites were doing? If you give the Holy Spirit an open mic, In your prayer time, He will show that to you like a neon flashing light. God's good like that. When you ask Him to reveal sin in your life, it's never hard to find. As long as you don't have justification and excuses and reasons why that it's there, if you just give God the open-ended question, you show me the sin in my life, you show me what I'm holding on to that I need to let go of, you show me what I need to pick up that I haven't embraced that you've given to me. You just show this to me, God. I'm ready to talk about it. He'll show you. I've had plenty of those conversations with the Lord. I, I know in one time, he's not, there's one place in my prayer life he's not silent. <laughs> he will reveal very quickly those things in your life. So I want you to understand that the, the, the point of this is that God wants to be in the center of our lives so that He can direct us. God can only direct you, God will only direct you from the center of your life. He's not going to be some peripheral, yeah, I'll come to you when I need you. If that's your relationship with God, He's not going to be your guide. You can still run to Him when you're in trouble, but it's going to be a very shallow relationship with the Lord. God wants to be deep inside where everything in your life, everything of meaning, is revolving around Him. And in that place, He will say, I will show you where I want you to go. Maybe just one day at a time, but He's in a place where He can guide you. And that's what He was doing for Israel. Again, Numbers chapter 9 talks about His guiding the the people through the wilderness. 
So as he begins to do that, I'm going to skip even, uh, well, I'll, I'll do a, a brief stop in Numbers chapter 9 where Israel is now under God's control and direction, which is God's design. Uh, notice this phrase again in chapter 9 in verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness. That's still continuing. God speaks to his people sometimes in the most profound ways in the wilderness. So be encouraged by that if you're there today. Now let's skip over to Numbers chapter 11 because here th here's where things start to go sour. Here's where Israel takes their one and a half year journey to the promised land and extends it an extra 40 years. These are the kind of mistakes we would like to avoid in our own lives. This is recorded for our benefit because this can happen. And it's frustrating for the Lord. It's frustrating for us. It's frustrating to watch the people that you love be in this place where they get stuck in a dry, lonely, desolate place for an extended season because their ears are shut and they are not allowing the Lord to be at the center of their life and to guide them through a very difficult journey. So they're in the wilderness, and remember, the wilderness is God's classroom. It is a testing ground. God has them in the wilderness with purpose. And in verse 1 it says, Soon the people began to complain about their hardship, and the Lord heard everything that they said. Now, their lips are going to betray their hearts here. Their lips are now going to show that God is not really any longer at the center of their focus. Even though He's placed Himself at the center of the camp, they're no longer yielding to His direction. When we begin to complain, it's often an indication that maybe God is pushing us this direction, but we're trying to go this direction, and it's frustrating us. There's something stopping us from getting what we want. And if it happens long enough, and we desire it deeply enough, and we just can't get there, the complaints begin to come. And it's a heart issue. Matthew 12 34, Jesus says that it's out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. So when we begin to complain and whine, it is actually an indication that something is wrong in the heart. Now listen to verse 2. It says, then the people screamed to Moses for help because, in verse 1, the Lord's anger blazed against them. They sent fire to rage among them, and He destroyed some of the people on the outskirts of the camp. Uh, God was pretty angry about them complaining since they, He had just delivered them from the land of Egypt, and He did not like what He was seeing on their hearts. And they were just complaining to complain. This, uh, as, as it says down here in verse 10, they were standing in the doorways of their tents, whining. It's just this murmuring going throughout the camp. They weren't trying to fix anything. They were just complaining. They weren't going to someone who could fix the problem. They were just venting their complaints to simply complain. We do the same thing. We can get in a place where we complain to people who can't fix the problem. That's a very bad habit. That's the birthing place of gossip and slander and all kinds of evil things that can happen with the tongues. So as they're just standing in the doorways of their tents whining to one another who can't fix the problem, look how quickly it changes in verse 2 when these fires from the Lord come and start killing people. Well, then the people scream to Moses for help. Now they're going to someone who can help them immediately. They wanted to fix this problem, and when they prayed to the Lord, when he prayed to the Lord, the fire stopped. After that, the area was known as Tabira, which means the place of burning, because fire from the Lord had burned among them. Now, we're going to learn where this originated from in verse 4. And I find this verse fascinating. It says, Then the foreign rabble 
who were traveling with the Israelites began to crave the good things of Egypt. And the people of Israel also began to complain. Oh, for some meat, they exclaimed. We remember the fish we used to eat for free in Egypt. And we had all the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic we wanted. That doesn't sound all that great, actually, to me. But now our appetites are gone. All we ever see is this manna. Oh, man, what a sour attitude. This is bad news. But it starts with the foreign rabble. What is the foreign rabble? The, the foreign rabble was this contingency that was moving with Israel. God always had a heart for the foreigner. Anybody outside of Israel that wanted to follow Israel's God was welcome. But these people who didn't share the same covenant with God, the same promises of God, the same passion for God, they started to grow tired in the wilderness and they began to complain. And Israel, rather than listening to the promises that their leaders were giving them, they started listening to the foreign rabble and it changed their hearts and it darkened them and it soured them and it set them up for failure. Let me ask you, church, and this is an important question. Do you let someone else do your thinking for you? We would all say, no, no, pastor. Mm -mm. I, I come up with all my own ideas. I form all my own opinions. We turn on the news, and some people would say, you know, I'd never listen to CNN. They're full of garbage. No, I listen to Fox. Oh, goodness. You can turn on any news station you want, and let me tell you something, you're listening to the rabble, you're listening to information that is pouring out faster than you could ever take it in, and they are not from people who share your kingdom perspective. And they can so quickly fill your minds and your hearts passionately about things that will direct your life, you better be careful of the rabble, because it's contagious what they do. Now, you might be thinking here and say, well, I'm safe from that. I'm not really interested in the news. I just stay away from that stuff. I just check in with Facebook <laughs> and Instagram, a little TikTok, you know, just a little bit, a few minutes a day, that's all. And how much of that forms your perspective on reality? How, how many times do you read something there and you get fired up? You better be careful of the rabble. That stuff is filled with perspectives that are so far from what God wants from His people. And we think that we're above that, that our thinking is clearer than that. Now, I'm not saying, church, that you have to purge your mind of all news and all social media. But you better be careful and acknowledge that that can get you thinking in patterns really fast. And it can start to do your thinking for you. And before you know it, you can turn the news on in the morning to see what it is you're supposed to be thinking, what it is you're supposed to be mad about, what it is you're supposed to be happy about. And you can do the same thing on social media. We get lazy in this age of information, and we let other people do our thinking for us. So how are we supposed to do this? Well, just the way all of you do this, I know that you do. The design is in John chapter 14, and I'm going to turn there. And this is so important. I want you to turn there with me. Hold your place back there, Numbers. But this is super important. Because we live in an age of information, and we have to get this right. Because if we don't, the rabble is going to replace what's supposed to be coming out from God's source of truth in our lives. And truth is what sets the believer apart from a world that is lost in darkness. If we lose that footing, church, we're in trouble. John chapter 14, verse 26. In your notes, if you're, if you're writing scripture verses down, I'm going to give a, a, a couple of references to you. Write John 14, 26 through 31. I want you to study that this week. Write John 15, 26. Write that down. I want you to read that this week. We're going to look at some of it right now, but I'm going to go really fast. Write John 16, verse 13 through 15. I want you to spend time on this this week. So now that you've written your references down, you're safe. You can lock eyes with me and you can listen because you need to hear this. This is super important. John 14, 26. Just, just listen. This is Jesus speaking. 
But when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, we know who that is. That is the Holy Spirit. He will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. Who is our teacher? The Holy Spirit. So I'm sure that you give him a lot more time than you ever would the news station and social media. Verse 27, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. Do do you have peace of mind and peace of heart tonight? If you're listening to the rabble, I can guess that you don't. You know why? Jesus says, the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled and afraid. Are you troubled and afraid? Listen to the rabble some more. It won't take you long. Sit down for one hour when you go home tonight and just listen to the news. Your peace will be gone and you'll be troubled and afraid. We're not giving the source of truth the kind of predominance it needs in our lives to give us the blessing and the gift that Jesus intended to give us. Peace of mind and peace in our hearts. We are meant to be walking around with that. But if we listen to the rabble long enough, that will be gone because the rabble, the world around us, cannot give us those things. So Jesus gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit who teaches us and guides us into all truth. He is called the Spirit of truth. Christians, we have dislocated the Spirit of truth and put our own sources of truth in his spot and we have lost our peace of mind and heart and we are troubled and afraid and it is fixable and Jesus warns us in verse 30 in John 14 the ruler of this world approaches he is coming but he has no power over me so don't let him dominate your thoughts and your mind, and your time. That belongs to the Spirit of God. He will guide you into truth that settles your heart in unsettling times. Now listen, John 15, 26 says, Again, I will send you the Advocate, the Spirit of truth. He will come to you from the Father, and He'll testify about me. When you begin to let the Holy Spirit sink down into you and take His rightful place, you will become a witness for Christ naturally because that's what the Spirit does. He testifies about Christ. Acts 1.8 says, When the Holy Spirit fell on the disciples, they became His witnesses. You will become my witnesses in all regions of the earth. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and He's going to point to me. That's what he does. He bears witness about me. The deeper the connection the Holy Spirit has with your heart, the more powerful and the more natural your witness for Christ will be. Now, if if your heart is filled with anxiety and fear and you lack peace of mind and peace of heart and your witness for Christ is nowhere to be seen, let me tell you this, the Spirit of God is not your source of truth. You've been overtaken by the rabble. Satan is so good at this. And if we don't see it for what it is in this day and age, Satan will get you for sure. It's really tough to make sure that the spirit of truth is guiding your thoughts and not the computer screen or the television screen. Finally, in John 16, verse 13, when the spirit of truth comes... He will guide you into all truth. Verse 14 says, He will bring me glory by telling you whatever He receives from me. Listen, church, to what Jesus just said. The Holy Spirit, in real time, is going to tell you what Jesus is saying to you. As the Holy Spirit is taking your prayers up to the throne room of God, like He does in Romans chapter 8, He takes that prayer of our heart and He takes it to the throne room of God. And Jesus, our high priest, is praying for us and He has a specific will and plan for our lives. And there are things that He wants us to do and there's things that He knows about us and knows about the future. There are going to be times when He has a message for us and He is going to speak to you, speak to your heart, speak to your mind 
through the Holy Spirit. He is going to speak to you that way. And if there is no room in our day to genuinely, deeply connect with the Spirit of God, we are not going to hear from our Lord. But if we make that a regular practice of our day and we become dependent on hearing from the Spirit as we read from the Bible and contemplate the Word of God and we pray, the Spirit will begin to actually tell us, according to Jesus' own words in John 16, He will tell you whatever He receives from me. Jesus will guide us in these difficult times. He will be our source of truth. And this is important because in John chapter 8, if you're writing references down, 31 and 32, listen, he says, you are, my, you are truly my disciples. If you remain faithful to my teachings, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. This is how a Christian walks in freedom and in victory by being guided by the Holy Spirit. And the only way that we can do this, church, is if we put God at the center of our camp and we're looking to Him in all things and we are allowing Him to guide us. Israel lost their way because of the rabble. And, and so are we. I see more Christians who have lost their peace and are troubled and are listening to the rabble than I encounter Christians who are deeply at peace and settled and in deep connection and communion with the Holy Spirit because they're taking the time to deeply seek God in His Word and through prayer. It's essential. If we're going to make it out of the wilderness, we've got to put God at the center. So let's get back to Numbers chapter 11 i got to move quickly. I just wanted to read verses 10 and 11. So Moses heard the families standing in the doorways of their tents whining, and the Lord became extremely angry. Moses also was very aggravated. And Moses said to the Lord, Why are you treating me, your servant, so harshly? Have mercy on me. What did I do to deserve the burden of all these people? So Moses is complaining too now, but you know what? There's a difference between what Moses is doing and what the people are doing. The people are complaining in their doorways, just venting and spouting off their complaints. Moses is taking his complaint to the Lord. That is the proper way to do this. It is not a sin to complain if done in the right tone. When something is wrong and needs to be righted, take it to the one who can fix it. Check your attitude. Be careful. Moses takes his complaint directly to the Lord. Well, let me ask you, Christian, is there something right now in your life that is frustrating the tar out of you and it's causing you to murmur and complain? Is there something in your life that you are not taking to the Lord? In other words, where are you venting those complaints? To the Lord or in your doorway, in the hallway? It matters to the Lord how we as His representatives do this. God becomes very angry when our witness as His representatives to the world becomes us just walking around complaining how hard we have it in this life. Is that our witness for Christ? Is that how we're going to attract a lost world? If people listen to your words and watch your life, are they going to say, I want to experience that kind of relationship with their God? Or are they avoiding you, trying just not to have to make eye contact because they don't want to hear all the complaints that you have? This matters to God. Our lips reveal the condition of our heart. Okay. I want to get to the part now where I talk about how do, you, how do you get out of the desert? How do you get out of the wilderness? How, how do you work through this? And I'm going to go right to the source, and I'm going to move super quick now. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. You can read Luke chapter 4 to hear all about Jesus' journey in the wilderness. I'm just going to hit the highlights. Luke 4, 1, it says, Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River, and he was led by the Spirit 
into the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. I want to talk about that wilderness now very quickly. This is a this place now that Jesus is entering into. It is a place that we feel distant from God. We can struggle to grow spiritually when we're in this place. It can be very hard to see God at work when we're in this place. And the wilderness can lead to a, a place of spiritual dryness. And this is why it matters if that spiritual dryness is left unchecked and we let this get out of hand and we don't understand what God is doing in His classroom, it can lead to doubt and to defeat in our Christian life, which is exactly what happened to Israel. I'm not going back to Numbers anymore, but if we read Numbers chapter 13, Israel sent spies into the land and they had totally lost their perspective. They had forgotten how powerful their God was and their hearts were filled with doubt, not with faith. And they ran away. And that's what extended their wilderness experience for an additional 40 years. A very costly mistake. This is a mistake we cannot make when we are in the wilderness. You know the great thing about the wilderness that I see in Luke chapter 4, if I skip down after all his temptations to verse 18? He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to bring the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released and that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Do you know when that crystal clarity came for Jesus? After the wilderness. He didn't have that clarity inside the wilderness, but when the time of testing was finished, he graduated from the wilderness with the Lord's anointing. The, the anointing of the Lord was upon him. When you finish your time, your season in the wilderness, if you graduate, the anointing of the Lord comes with the graduation. If you fail, you repeat the course as long and as many times as necessary. That's what happened to Israel. So I want to finish with this uh, this statement from Hosea. For those of you who are in this place, because the the place of the Lord, and I'll, I'll give you this far in advance because for some of you it's going to take you a little while to find Hosea. All right, Hosea chapter 2, start, start making your way there. But if you're, if you're in this place, if you're feeling spiritually dry, here's what I want you to do tonight. Number one, I want you to check the basics. Is God at the center of your life? You are not going to get out of the wilderness if that's not his position. Check your gauges. Is God directing your pursuits? If you're stuck in the wilderness, make sure God is in his rightful place at the center of your life. If he's not, you're going to be in the wilderness a long time. Get that right. Number two, orient your thinking. Here's a nasty trick the devil does. Whose faithfulness is being tested in the wilderness? Sometimes we turn it around on God. We look at our circumstances and say, what kind of God lets, lets this happen in my life? What kind of God would allow this kind of suffering to go on without explanation? And we start to act as though it's God's faithfulness that's being tested in the wilderness. Church, God's faithfulness was already tested. Romans 5.8 says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. His faithfulness is established. It needs no more testing. It's our faithfulness that's being tested. Don't allow Satan to mix up your thinking and make you think that God is in the classroom and you're testing his faithfulness. You'll never get out of the wilderness like that. Your faithfulness is being tested. Will your faith remain in the midst of difficult circumstances? That's your faith that's being tested, not God's. Don't let that get mixed up. So check your, 
Check the basics. Check your thinking. Draw close to God through the Word of God and through prayer. Give the Holy Spirit that rightful place. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Draw close to God. He will draw close to you in James 4. My final piece of advice would be to fellowship with other Spirit-filled disciples. Get around people who do have God at the center of their lives. Like these are, these are all really important things if you're in the wilderness and you want to find your way through and you want to graduate and you want to have the clarity of your call and the clarity of God's purpose over you and God's anointing touch on your life. These are things that have to be in order. But I want to close here. Have you found uh, Isaiah chapter 2? Say, if you got it, say amen. amen. If you haven't found it yet, say oh me. Good job, church. All right. So Hosea 2 verse 14 This is God's love for Israel now. He's saying, but then I will win her back once again. I will lead her into the desert, which is their wilderness, and speak tenderly to her there. I will return her vineyards to her. And I love this phrase. I'll transform the valley of trouble into a gateway of hope. She'll give herself to me there like she did long ago when she was young, when I freed her from the captivity of Egypt. If you are wandering in the wilderness tonight, I want you to see a glimpse of God's heart for you in this. He longs to speak tenderly to you, to draw you back to Himself, and to take all the trouble that is piled up into your life and to transform that into hope, meaningful hope and he wants to reconnect in a deep way he points back to when you were delivered from Egypt in other words for us that's when we gave our life first to Christ when we were first washed clean of all of our sin the journey often becomes messy again remember that God has not abandoned you in the wilderness He is meeting with you there, and He is testing your faith, and He wants you to pass. Let's pray. Father, I I pray over my friends and family here tonight. The wilderness is a tough place to be. It's a difficult class. But Father, I pray that you have given clarity and hope and encouragement for those who find themselves there tonight. Reveal your heart to them, Father. And Father, I pray for Christians here tonight who know of those close to them who are in the wilderness, that you have given them a glimpse, uh, something to minister with as you've revealed your heart to them. God, we thank you for the times that you have been so faithful to us. Help us to get the basics right. Help us to keep you at the center of all things in our lives. Reveal your truth to us through your Holy Spirit so that we will not be overcome by the rabble of this world which can fill our hearts and minds with fear and anxiety and depression. Free us from those things, Father. Minister deeply tonight, Father, to that one who feels lost and wounded and alone and dry a million miles from you. Tap them on the shoulder tonight and remind them you're in this journey with them. And you're looking forward to the end of this class when your clarity and your purpose and your hope floods in Father, help our faith to stand strong. Give us the strength day by day, one day at a time. We turn our hearts to you. We turn our eyes to you. Guide us through this journey. Open our ears that we would hear everything that you have to say to us. And open our eyes that we would not miss a single thing that you're showing us. Help us to let go of anything in our past that we are still trying to hang on to, that we would be found totally faithful to you alone. God bless your people tonight. 
As we close tonight, I want to give you one final opportunity. You've got a glimpse of the Lord's heart tonight, and I wonder, do you know Jesus in a way that your heart clings to Him deeply? That He really is your treasure in the pursuit of all things in this life? Maybe you just know about Jesus, about the stories, but tonight God is opening your eyes that you would know Jesus in the deepest possible way. God calls this saving faith. Would you release all things of your life, all control, all that you are and all that you have to His care? Through your faith in Christ, Jesus can cleanse you, forgive you, wash you clean, and bring you into this journey and guide you through this difficult life and give you peace and joy in the process. Would you draw close to God tonight through what Jesus has accomplished on your behalf? He died for you on the cross. He rose again, offering you new life. And He invites you tonight, if you will come through the work, His shed blood, He will do all of this and you will begin a new journey with Him. Father, in a sensitive moment right now for any heart that doesn't know you in a life-giving way, Holy Spirit, would you reveal to them their need for Jesus as their Savior and Lord and guide their hearts to call out to Him right now. Friend, call out to God right now. God, I have sinned against you. I have rebelled against you. I have acted as the judge of what is right and wrong for my life. And I am wrong. Jesus, I believe you died in my place on the cross, bearing the penalty of my sin. Please forgive me. I believe you rose on the third day just like the Bible says to give me the gift of eternal life. I receive that gift from you. I bow my knee and confess you as my Lord. From this day forward, help me to live for you and to follow you and to bring you joy. Save my soul and bring me into the family of God Right now, I receive you by faith. If this is the cry of your heart right now, would you just place your hand up in the air, the eyes of the Lord in this place. God, I mean every word that I'm saying. Anyone in here tonight? No hands in this room have gone up. You've just heard the message of hope, Christians. So Father, I pray that we would take this hope out of the midst of our troubles, and that we would give this to the world effectively. Help us, Jesus, to be your witnesses. May we bring you glory. Fill us with your spirit. Cleanse us tonight. We love you, Lord. We trust you with all of our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.